Edinburgh, Scotland's ancient capital. A thousand years of history, a thousand years of hauntings. Perhaps its most convincing account didn't originate in the city, but from much farther afield, the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. As a child, this story scared me more than any other, and is the account that renowned author and parapsychologist Peter Underwood believed, above all others he investigated, to be the most convincing. Learmonth Gardens is a street in Edinburgh's affluent Comley Bank area. The area was gifted to the borough in 1916 in memory of Alexander Learmonth, provost of Linlithgow from 1802 to 1807. In the 1930s, Sir Alexander Seaton lived on the street and in 1936, he and his wife Zayla set sail for a holiday of a lifetime to Egypt. While there, they planned to visit some of the country's most spectacular places. The Tomb of Tutankhamun, the Temple of Luxor, and the Great Pyramid of Giza. It was on one of these visits that events started to unfold that led to one of Edinburgh's most terrifying hauntings. The following is the first-hand account of what happened, taken from the book The Transgressions of a Baronet, written by Sir Alexander Seaton. The temple at Luxor is beyond my powers of description. It has to be seen to be believed. Many hours can be spent among the temples and beautiful buildings all around. The Valley of the Kings disappointed me, except for the tune of Tutankhamun. There was really little to see. After two wonderful days, we wended our way back to Cairo, and this time to the Mena Hotel, on the edge of the desert, and only ten minutes walk from the Sphinx. The Great Pyramid, of course, towers right over the hotel, and at night its shadow could be seen cast around everywhere. We did the usual sightseeing that all tourists have to do, including a ride on a rather unpleasant camel, and then retired for a bathe in the swimming pool, and dinner on a table at the edge of the pool. In a mood of complete satisfaction, caused by good eating, excellent brandy, and the cool of the evening, but most important of all, the receipt of a very welcome cheque from a Glasgow editor to whom I had sent a description of my journey by destroyer. I had pleasure in receiving Abdul. He told me that new tombs had been found recently behind the pyramid and although not of any great historical value, it might be as well if we saw the finishing stages of one of these tombs being examined, which was going on the next day. My brother could arrange, he said. It was arranged, therefore, that he would collect us the next morning after an early breakfast, and for an extra fee he would take us into the newly opened tomb, a thing the Egyptians were very much against. I had a feeling in my bones that something was going to happen over this, and it was only with the greatest of difficulty that Zayla cajoled me into going with her. I wish earnestly to God that we had not gone. I'm not an Egyptologist, so I will not attempt to describe the tomb beyond the fact that it was pre-mummy era, we were informed, and had at one point been filled with the mud of the Nile, when it was known in history to have caused widespread damage. When this was, I don't know, but I believe it to be four or five thousand years ago. We went down some roughly hewn rock steps, about thirty of them, and there, lying on a stone slab and uncovered was the remains of a skeleton. You could see the skull quite clearly and the leg bones, but few ribs were left, although the spine was almost intact. With a feeling of awe, I looked around and could well imagine the placing of this poor body on the slab and the final sealing of the door at its feet. Our guide told us that it was the body of a high-class girl, but there was no question of her being a princess. I couldn't find out her age, nor could I find out her name. Time had erased that information, but that she was one of the countless hundreds that had been unearthed from behind the pyramids, there is no doubt. The antiquity of the bones could be seen by the fact that although as light as a feather, they would crumble very soon. As we left, I remember thinking to myself how strange that one day someone may be looking at my bones and wondering what the devil the owner looked like. I said a small prayer and then made the others come on up into the sunshine and life. Zayla seemed fascinated by it and slipped back past us to have one more look. I was only too glad to have a smoke. The following sequence of events is exactly what happened in their correct order. Hundreds of daily papers and magazines have given their versions and verdicts, 
but I believe that I'm the only person alive who can tell the story of the Egyptian bone as it happened. On the way back to the Mena house, it was suggested that we should call it the Pyramid Souvenir Shop. To my surprise, Zayla rejected the idea. That night, after a bathe, Zayla told me that she'd gotten a wonderful souvenir in the shape of a bone that she'd taken off the skeleton we'd seen that morning. She showed it to me, and to my eyes it looked like a digestive biscuit, apart from it being slightly convex and the shape of a heart. I told her to put it away, and indeed never gave it another thought until we were back in Edinburgh some weeks later. We'd asked some friends round for supper, and Zayla produced this somewhat grotesque relic. I produced a small case which had once contained a clock, and we put the bone in the dining room on a table. Just as our friends were leaving, there was the most almighty crash, and a huge piece of the roof parapet landed about two feet away from us. It could have killed anyone. Whether this can be connected to the bone or not is difficult to say, but it certainly scared us and was very hard to explain. A few nights later, after we'd gone to bed, Nanny came running upstairs to say that she'd heard someone moving about in the drawing room. I went downstairs, but there was nothing there. Just imagination and the rain outside, I told Nanny. That night in my sleep, I do remember hearing a crash, but didn't think anything of it at the time. The following morning, however, Zayla accused me of being careless the night before and of having upset the corner table. Sure enough, there the table lay on its side with a small glass case beside it and the bone on the floor. I apologised, thinking I must have carelessly placed the table unevenly against the wall and the vibration of the traffic must have shaken it over. One night, a few weeks later, when Nanny was out, we heard someone on the stairs and, not expecting her so early, Zayla went out to see if she was alright, but there was no one there. We didn't say anything to Nanny about it, but during the following night something kept waking us up at different times, and none of us could explain the noises. My nephew, young Alasdair Black, came to stay for a few days shortly after these strange occurrences, and one morning he calmly announced that he had seen a funny dressed person going upstairs. He assured me that he had gone to the lower lavatory the night before and had seen this person. He didn't seem to be the slightest bit concerned, so I didn't say anything more but decided to sit up one night to see if I could see anything. We kept some valuable snuff boxes in the drawing room and I thought perhaps someone might be trying to get at them. So, having made quite sure the drawing room windows were all locked, I locked the door, putting the key into my pocket. For hours I watched from the balcony outside our bedroom, feeling rather foolish doing so. Nothing happened so I went to bed, only to be rudely awakened by a yell from Zayla that someone was downstairs. Grabbing my revolver I dashed downstairs to meet a very scared nanny. Of course the door was locked and the key was still in my pocket. I yelled to Zayla to get the key and when we finally got into the drawing room it looked as if a battle royale had taken place there. Chairs were upset, books flung about, and there, in the middle of the chaos, was that damn bone, looking as harmless and more like a biscuit than ever. And the windows were still locked. It was after this episode that I decided we were up against something, a poltergeist or some such thing. It had been known, but I had never had the misfortune to come across the results of one. Zayla, who was very superstitious, found a local soothsayer, who really said practically nothing except that her fee was one pound and was of no help. Weeks passed without anything unusual happening, and then it started again. Noises, banging, and always in the drawing room. Zayla thought it was something to do with the bone and had the idea of moving the articles which had been flung about downstairs to my sitting room. This we did, and of course the bone, table and all came down as well. After a week or so, I got fed up with having my sitting room cluttered up and said that I'd shift all the things back the following day. That night, however, something nearly did the job for me. As usual, there it was, the bone, on the floor, and as much furniture as could be tipped all over the place. This time I did connect this with the bone and told Zayla I was going to burn it. Unfortunately, this was met with such a storm of abuse from Zayla that I was only too glad to leave the whole thing and go out for a drink to forget the whole incident. I told some members of my club what had happened, which caused much laughter, and I wasn't believed, 
except for a dear old chap called Colonel Evie Coates. We had a long talk, and when I left the club that night, a little tight, I left with the avowed intention of destroying the bone. When I arrived home, I found the bone had been at it again. This was much earlier than usual, but the damage was more severe, as this time it was obvious that the table upon which the bone lay had been subjected to what one might say was severe pressure as one of the legs was cracked. I just couldn't believe my eyes. During the course of the next day or so, I was pestered by a very charming reporter from the Express, who had a cock and bull story that he asked me to look at. It was such utter tripe that I told him so, and in so doing, I opened up the gates of a dam with miles of water behind it. From then on, after the article had appeared in print, my life became hell on earth. How the reporters got hold of the story, I don't know, but every paper seemed to want a statement of some description or another but I was adamant I had no comment to make. The Young Express reporter asked if he could borrow the bone for a week and write up a daily article on it. I agreed to this, but nothing happened of any note passed in the reporter's possession, and it was returned to me. A few more weeks elapsed, and still the papers molested me. I had nothing to tell him until one evening, around six o'clock, when Nanny reported she was scared out of her life. The story we heard really worried me. Apparently the same thing had happened. Noises, etc., but this time there was a terrific crash followed by breaking glass, and she'd been too frightened to go up to the drawing room to see what had happened. And by this time I knew what to expect, and I was amazed to find the room untouched except for the table and the bone. The table was smashed on its side, the glass canopy under which the bone rested was in small pieces and the bone itself was broken up into about five separate pieces. And I thought, alright, you can have your story now, and arranged for a cameraman from the Scottish Daily Mail to take a picture of it. And you should have seen the story the next day. Now I gave the bone to the reporter who'd covered it, but it was soon returned to me because apparently he became seriously ill. Same old trouble? My suggestion that there was a connection with this fact and the fact that the previous reporter had had a car accident was met with a great deal of ridicule, however. So we decided to forget the whole thing and pray for peace. Peace was not to be, for on Boxing Day night we had a really cheerful crowd coming to dinner, which was scheduled for 7.30. Cocktails were to be served upstairs in the drawing room. Everyone was happy and in good spirits, and it was very cold outside. I'd laid a big log fire in a large fireplace of the L-shaped room. And naturally, the subject of the bone came up, and to my disgust and dismay, Zayla, who'd gotten a friend of hers, a doctor, to mend the bone as far as possible, had placed it on a table opposite the door leading into the room. This of course made a good conversational interest, and it came out that the bone was a sacrum, or the bone at the base of the spine joining the hip bones. Although not being a doctor, I wouldn't swear to this. Whilst we were talking, and a fresh round of drinks was being served, the entire table, bone and all, went hurling onto the opposite wall with a terrific thump. No one was standing near it, nor did anyone see it happen. It just happened. Chaos followed, the maid fainted, as did Zayla's rather hysterical cousin Gert. The party became a fiasco from then on. No one picked the bone up because I insisted that my room downstairs should be used. The story was spread, of course, and all sorts of things said about it. In the new year, the American papers got hold of the story and they went to town with it. The whole story being magnified and I found myself again the leading figure in a story which I had become to hate. Several spiritualistic meetings were held on the subject, to which literally hundreds of people came, and I only wish now that I had a good agent. I could have made a fortune out of that. Many unkind people thought that I had and was keeping the ball rolling to gather in the money, but this was certainly not so. Amongst the thousands of letters I received was one from a Dr. Carter, Dr. Carter of Tutankhamun tomb fame, in which he asked me to respect his confidence by not publishing its contents, but he assured me that things quite inexplicable like this could happen, indeed had happened, and will go on happening. I'm not a Roman Catholic, although I had a very great respect for my uncle, who was Father Benedict at the Fort Augustus Abbey. 
I suggested that he should come over and exercise whatever it was, and he obtained permission and came to the scene. It was a solemn visit, carried out in Zela's absence. The bone, having been blessed, was then destroyed by me by burning, and I made certain that it had all gone for good. The strange thing is that after all this we had peace in the house, although Zela could never forgive me for destroying the bone, and it didn't help our already rocky marriage at all. I can give no answer as to what caused these mysterious happenings, but to my mind, there was some strange power release that we humans are apt to laugh at, but which was oh so very real. Looking back on this experience, I still think that it was one of the most horrible experiences that I've ever been through, happening as it did both in the daytime and the night. My own interpretation of the matter is that through some uncanny power of religion it was brought under destructive control. But if, and I emphasise the word if, it really did carry a curse, as many people thought. The curse certainly didn't end when I destroyed the bone by fire. And from 1936 onwards, trouble, sometimes grave, seemed to always be around the corner. My daughter became ill with the result that she had to have an operation on her eardrum. Then Zayla had the same trouble in both ears. My troublesome kidney was still causing me great discomfort and altogether life was very difficult. Learmonth Gardens is part of an affluent but apparently extremely haunted part of the capital. Within a half square mile you have famously haunted locations. There's Buckingham Terrace, the Learmonth Hotel, Anne Street and the Dean Cemetery. Could the Seton haunting be the result of a cursed object or is it something different? Something that seeps through its foundations and affects the very land that it's built on. <laughs>